Case schemes like this have been designed and used over thousands of years. Most of them are considered highly insecure today. You would never use them for an application on the internet. Okay, so sort of more serious encryption schemes started being designed uh, during the Second World War. During the Second World War, um, armies were using radios a lot more to communicate sensitive data from battlefield to command center, say to their general. And the confidentiality of this information really, really was of utmost importance. So I want to give you three examples of how clever encryption schemes were used during World War II, two of which were found to be insecure, while one remained secure through the duration of the Second World War. Okay, the first is something the Americans used, a very creative uh, encryption scheme. So they used Navajo Indians, called Navajo code talkers. So what the Americans did was they recruited people from the Navajo Indian tribe. They chose the Navajo Indian tribe because their language, the Navajo language, uh, it's, it belongs to the so-called Nadin family of languages, which is totally disjoint from Asian or European languages. So if you hear a Navajo Indian speak and you're familiar with any Asian or European language, the sounds just make no sense to you. It's a very unfamiliar language. Okay, an American um, described the sound of Navajo language at the time as saying it's a weird succession of guttural, nasal, tongue twistal sounds. We couldn't even transcribe it, much less crack it. So the idea is very simple. Train Navajo Indians, a small number of them, um, send one to the battlefield and have one by the general and command central. So when the general wants to send the, uh, the battlefield commander a very sensitive message, uh, instructions for example, he would write the message down in English. The Navajo Indian would, trans would translate the message from English to Navajo and then speak it over the radio. The receiver in the battlefield would be Navajo Indian who would recognize the sounds and the words and translate the Navajo message back to English. Okay, there are lots of problems with this. For instance, uh, the Navajo language doesn't have words for fighter plane, bomber, torpedo plane, dive bomber, bombs, and so on. So they had to make up a code. So they had some sort of natural means of birds, for example, to correspond to military objects. And these were the corresponding Navajo words for those birds. Because the message involved the word observation plane, the novel Indian would read the word for owl, which is this. And which, again, sounds very bizarre when pronounced correctly by a novel Indian. Okay, this, this was used especially against uh, the battles fought, uh, fought against the Japanese in the Pacific. And it's believed that the Japanese were never, ever able to decipher this code. Okay, so in this example, what's the secret key? So when the general and the battlefield commander actually are talking in this way, what's the secret key that they share? The Navajo. They're not the Navajo Indian, the actual people are the secret key. So how does the attacker find the secret key? Well, they have to find a Navajo Indian. And presumably the Japanese and the Germans weren't able to get their hands on a real live Navajo Indian. And so this was, in fact, a very secure way, it turns out, to protect communications during certain battles in the Second World War. Okay. This doesn't work well on the internet, right? If you want to send Bob an email message, you can't find someone who speaks Navajo and get them to speak the message for you. So it doesn't scale to internet technologies, but it worked very well during the Second World War. Here's a very prominent example of the use of encryption in the Second World War, the so-called Enigma machines used by the Germans. This was a machine that was built by a German company in the 1920s. And at the beginning of the Second World War, the German military uh, modified the machine to make it sort of more secure by adding more features to it, more choices. And there were thousands of these built during the war, and the Germans used these in all branches of the military, the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, to convey all kinds of battlefield information, uh, sensitive information, uh, in an encrypted form. So a bit more closely looking at this machine, this may not be very legible, but it has four basic parts, a keyboard, a plug board, a glow board, and some wheels. So the, the idea was the person, say Al, is sending a message, would type the message on the keyboard. Each time she typed a letter, say the letter A, a letter in the glow board would light up. And that would be the scrambled letter. So when she typed an A, some letter would light up, say the B, and she would replace the A by a B, and so on. And this was cleverly designed so that each time the person typed an A, a different letter would light up and the secret key would decide which letters would light up. The keys were the plug board and the actual wheels. So the plug board looks like this. 
because it has the letters of the English alphabet. And what the operator would do was would, would put these plugs between pairs of letters. So here, for instance, the letter, uh, I can read it, F is paired with the letter, I think that's an M, which means when the uh, operator would press the letter F, it would be transformed to an M right away. Okay, what does this remind you of, this plug board? Yeah. Uh, same yeah, that's the Vats Vatsuyana cipher we just broke in a few minutes by hand. So the first part of the Enigma machine was just pairing up the English alphabet with these, with the plug board. And that's precisely the Vatsuyana cipher which was designed 2,000 years ago. So clearly that by itself is highly insecure because we were able to break some examples in, by hand in 10 minutes. So there was more to encrypting the message. So once the plug board letters were used, so say the letter A was transformed to an N, then they would use, the, the machine used these wheels. There were four wheels, each had new letters of the English alphabet. The wheels had some initial secret setting, which is part of the secret key. And so uh, we, if you press an F, I said, that gets transformed to an M. And then the first wheel would transform the letter to a second letter. Okay, now each time a key was pressed, the first wheel would rotate by one character. So the wheels were always changing. When the first wheel rotated 26 times around, the second wheel would rotate one character. When the second wheel completed a full rotation, the third wheel would advance by one more position, and so on. So the wheel's positions were constantly changing, which means each time the operator pressed the letter F, um, it was encrypted to a different letter. And that was fairly unpredictable because uh, if you didn't know the plug board settings and the wheel settings, it was rather hard to determine what the letter F would be transformed to the next time it was pressed. Okay, so there are more details I can't get into, I don't have time for, but this was the Enigma machine used widely by the Germans in the Second World War to encrypt uh, data for all kinds of military applications. So the, I said there were thousands of machines, so the British over the time had captured several machines. So they actually had several working Enigma machines, which helps you if you want to break a cipher. And the person who spent a year on this during the Second World War was Alan Turing, who some of you know as you know, one of the founders of computer science, modern computer science. In the late 30s, he designed a theoretical model that described the computer before computers were actually built. So Turing worked on this for quite a while during the Second World War, and he found a method for uh, totally breaking the Enigma machine. So given some captured scrambled data, the British were able to, with a fair amount of work, recover the unscrambled data without knowing the key settings, which would be, which be the plug board settings and the initial settings of the wheel. Okay, so the British were very successful in using this and attacking the Enigma machine. And they kept it secret during the World War, so they didn't want the Germans to know that they could break their machine. Otherwise, the Germans would, break the would change their machine. Okay, another nice example is the Lorenz cipher, also used by the Germans in the Second World War. This was a much more secure machine than the Enigma machine. So in fact, the Germans thought this was completely unbreakable. For example, it had 12 wheels instead of four like the Enigma machine, which gave the wheel settings a lot more possibilities than with the Enigma machine. So they thought this was unbreakable. There were very few machines like this built, and they were used to encrypt the most sensitive strategic information by the German military. So apparently Hitler used this machine for encoding his personal communications to his generals. The British never, ever had a copy of the machine. So during the World War, they wanted to break the code. They had no idea what the machine looked like. They didn't have an actual copy of the machine. So in the, late, in, in the early 40s, Bill Tutt, who was a graduate student studying mathematics at the time, went to work for the, uh, the, the secret agency in the UK. All he had was a bunch of scrambled data, nothing else. He spent six months carefully studying the scrambled data. And after that time, he was able to discover what the machine must look like. So he was able to reconstruct the machine purely by looking at scrambled data. Okay, he also discovered ways to descramble the data from the scrambled data, which was very tedious by hand. And so to actually implement this quickly, the British built Colossus, which is now known as the world's first electronic computer. Bill Tutt, by the way, uh, came to Waterloo in the early 60s and was a professor here until he died in 2002. So his work was really important for, um, for the British and the Allies in decrypting German communications. Historians have said that the work by Tutt and Turing in breaking Enigma and Fish and Lorenz machine 
uh, likely shorten the World War by at least two years, in the process likely saving hundreds of thousands or millions of lives.